Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today in the show, we're joined by Sue Ennis, VP of Corporate Development at Hut8. In this episode, we discuss Hut8's conservative growth strategy, building out alternative lines of revenue, and how Hut8 is hodling 8,000 plus Bitcoin. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for your time. Excited to talk about Hut 8. I think you guys are one of the only miners I haven't had specifically on the show to talk about your guys' ears. So I'm excited to tee off the conversation here. Yeah. Hey, so excited to be here. Love your episode. Um, and a lot of our investors actually watch your your podcast. So I'm really excited to be here today and talking with the community. That's great. Thank you. So we'll we'll tee off with like the the normal question and anyone who's familiar with this, maybe zoom ahead to the, the meatier, juicier parts of the conversation, but who is HUD8? What do you guys do? And then your role at HUD8 for those who are just still new to the community and working themselves into the Bitcoin mining scene. Right. So I'm Sue, VP of Corp Dev and head of IR for HUD8. We are one of the oldest and largest Bitcoin miners in the industry. Uh, we've been around since late 2017, early 2018. Uh, we're based in North America, in Canada, in Alberta. Um, and in January of 2022, we actually also bought data centers. So we're uh, uh, one of the largest and oldest Bitcoin miners, but we're also in the data center, traditional data center space, which I'm sure we'll get into. And that's HUD8. Awesome. Appreciate that intro. So 2022 saw a lot of different narratives play out for Bitcoin miners. We all started off with like great margins and then they quickly collapsed between Bitcoin price going down, difficulty rising. And then also the energy sector really coming to bear. Uh, so we can dig into that with Hut 8. The two narratives specifically I've seen for Hut 8, as I said before the show started, was the conservative deployment figures, which a lot of other public miners did not choose to go that path, I think, to their detriment at this point. And then also the decision to hodl their Bitcoin. You guys have actually suck out. You and Marathon are the only ones to have not sold any Bitcoin this past year. I think it makes sense to start with the expansion numbers beginning of the year you guys think i have it here had about 2 exa hash deployed yeah 2.3 exa hash deployed as of the beginning of the year at the end of the year you guys are about 3.5 exa hash not all of us deployed or online at the moment but Walk me through how you guys sort of thought about deployment of miners and how you guys brought new facilities online. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the reasons why we focus on being one of the oldest in this space is that this is not our first bear market. Um, we lived and survived and actually continued to scale through the 2019, early 2020 bear market. But we've certainly learned a lot in past bear markets and also really the importance of taking a balance sheet first approach to everything that you do. So for example, in the spring of 2021, you know, we had a lot of people asking us, why aren't you making crazy equipment orders? You know, even though it's 90 bucks a terahash to $120 a terahash, you should be making orders. And we were like, well, we're not because in the last bear market, we actually went shopping for equipment at 20 to $30 a terahash. And we've experienced firsthand how fast things can go sideways in this asset class and the importance, again, of taking that balance sheet first approach to everything that you do and focusing on uncorrelated and diversified lines of revenue so that no matter what direction Bitcoin is trading in or where that you know the industry is as a whole, you still have a way to make money. And again, we feel very validated with this approach. If you look at some of our peers, it's been really sad to see because we're friends with most people in the industry, but you've seen a lot of our major peers capitulate Either you know stock price go down to twenty five cents, uh, you know tremendous debt due, filing for Chapter Eleven bankruptcy. We're not in that position because again, we didn't make crazy levered bets or paid bull market pricing in the bull market. We really focused on diversification and staying conservative, but also setting up our business so that we could continue to hodl because we obviously believe in the ethos of you know buy low, sell high, or in this case, mine low, sell high. Um, 
so, so that's been a major focus for us. And, and, you know, when I talk about diversification, um, I'm talking about, you know, things like last year and actually up until this year, until the Terra Luna collapse, you know, when we started hearing rumors about that, um, we had a portion of our HODL that was earning uh, yield in a yield account with Galaxy and Genesis. It was earning between two to 4%. Um, we bought this data center business, uh, which is about 4.4 million a quarter, um, five data centers across Canada, tons of room for growth and expansion. And it's a completely uncorrelated line of revenue. So it's cloud, co-location, disaster recovery. And we can certainly get into, though, how we think this infrastructure is incredibly significant, not only for Web 2 and Web 3, but but also just the growing crypto ecosystem. Um you know, we've got a mach- we've got a minor repair shop. We're the only authorized micro BTA repair shop in Canada, so that means that we repair our own machines in house, which reduces a carbon footprint. Also helps us save money on shipping, and you know, when machines break down, increases our uptime. But we also actually support micro BT customers throughout North America and Northern Europe. So that is sort of another smaller but but meaningful. Um, uh, line of fiat based revenue for us. So those are just some of the strategies that we've employed and how we took um, a different lens in terms of how we built in at the end stages of the 2021 bull market and then have survived and continue to scale in in this bear market. And one last thing I will say is we've said this on our past two earnings calls, um, you know, another benefit of balance sheet first and the whole point behind balance sheet first is that you can go shopping when things go on sale. So M&A is absolutely on our radar. Inorganic M&A um, for growth is, is really a big priority for us right now. We've got a couple of things we've been looking at since the summer, but um, we didn't really see premiums come down until at least, you know, I think the last couple of months is when we've seen sellers get a little more rational. Um, obviously, we're a publicly traded company, so there's only so much I can say, but I can certainly tell you, as per your question, that's what we're focused on. This is what we're excited about. And this is sort of, these are some of the main differentiators between us and sort of everyone else in the industry. Love that. And there's definitely a, a few lines of conversation we could take from there. Let's talk about the different lines of revenue. And you guys even mentioned this in your first PR of the year uh, from January of 2022, that recurring revenue is a big deal, right? Like setting up your Bitcoin mind so that you have that consistent revenue, those consistent cash flows. And I'm assuming that it's the same for, uh, money from the data centers, right? So walk me through how you guys came to understand and work in the data center line. And the background for that question is many people just want to mine Bitcoin. They don't want to do anything else. They just want to mine Bitcoin and call it a day. But you guys are branching in different sectors, which obviously takes a little bit more work. Yeah. I mean, look, we're incredibly bullish on Bitcoin. Like That's why we're in Bitcoin and not just data centers. Um, and we really strongly believe in the importance of of hodling and mining as much Bitcoin as possible before the next halving in May of 2024. So that's a major priority for us. But the reason why we moved into the data center play is number one, Jamie, our CEO, who is sad she couldn't be here today. Our CEO, she, um, for the past 20 years, has been working in the data center space. So she's the gal that companies like IBM, Kojiko, BlackBerry have called in when there's a piece of data infrastructure that's in need of transformation or in need of being turned into like a multi-billion dollar um, line of business. So, so the point of that is that she takes a really unique operator's lens in this industry and is able to bridge silos of information in ways that I don't think a lot of operators in this industry have been able to. And that just comes from her experience. Um, so she actually knew about these assets before she even became CEO of Head8. She knew that this publicly traded company wanted to focus on 5G, wasn't really interested in their cloud business. So we picked up five data centers and 400 existing enterprise customers in the government, financial services, and gaming space for like 30 million bucks cash, no debt. Um, And the whole plan is number one, have an uncorrelated, completely diversified line of revenue. Even if Bitcoin were to go to zero, which we obviously don't think it's going to, but if it did, we still have a thriving business. Um, Number two, you know, one of the problems in the traditional data and uh, space in sorry in the traditional data infrastructure space is that a lot of um, compliance teams and operators there and the big boys like switch equinix or aws are number one not comfortable with open and distributed systems uh, number two will often charge you know year-long saas based model pricing when in fact sometimes a crypto company or like a decentralized platform needs just you know 72 to six months worth of compute. 
So, so we, we saw a really interesting niche to fill sort of this like mid market tier customer that was building in the web two, web three gaming, you know, even machine learning and AI space, but who wasn't sort of, who isn't sort of big enough to warrant the Amazon web services, number one customer model, or again, SaaS based pricing that they ask for. So, so this is where we are able to serve like what we see as a growing, but deeply underserved market. And so we're going to be filling our, the excess capacity in our data centers um, with services in that uh, to, to serve those customers. And we do that by um, we've got, we've got a composable computing platform called liquid stack. And that actually helps our customers in-house switch from, you know, cloud and colo to maybe they need some compute to, if I'm a gamer and I need compute to amplify an in-game experience that I want to do using an NFT. We have the composable compute infrastructure that our clients can flip back and forth towards different iterations of compute. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about it. Love that. So devil's advocate here in terms of getting XAHash online, a lot of Bitcoin miners this year thought, hey, I need to put all these ASICs online as fast as possible because difficulty is going up. And if I don't keep pace with difficulty, keep pace with other miners, then my actual line of revenue is going to crumble. I think that has basically fallen apart as an argument after what we've seen over the last few weeks, but it's still out there. At what point does this really matter for you guys? So I want to pitch the question over to you. At what point do you start looking at the Bitcoin network and you look at getting miners online and start wondering, well, maybe we should dedicate like more capital to this space? Yeah, well, well, like I said, we're um, inorganic growth is on our radar and we're incredibly bullish on mining, especially moving into the next halving. Um, we absolutely monitor, you know, where the price of energy is, what our cost per coin is in real time. Um, like right now we're mining a coin for about 13,800 us. Um, and so in terms of building out capacity, we did focus on upgrading our two sites in Alberta to 109 megawatts. Um, and that's all basically cutting edge equipment. I think we've got about three more, 3000 more machines to go in. And then that site will be, those sites will be fully at capacity. Um, so, so yeah, in terms of plugging in miners and growth, again, that, that inorganic m and is certainly on our radar and we really focused on upgrading our existing sites. Cause like I said, we're one of the oldest and largest, right? So we did have older machines. We had some, I think Clark's in there. Um, and, and so that was a big focus for us is making sure our, our sites were as efficient as possible. Um, and yeah. Cool. Let's talk about m and strategies. Talked a little bit about that with Zach Bradford uh, from Clean Spark the last two times I've had him on. And most people have had like a pretty similar aspect or thoughts about purchasing distressed assets, but I want to pitch it over to you, get your thoughts on it. What sort of distressed assets are you looking for? Are they Canadian? Are they US based? Can they be global? Is there a certain sort of model you're looking for? Maybe an energy type? Are you guys looking to pick up distressed assets that are fully built out or are you willing to retrofit it yourself? Uh, Those sort of things. Yeah, I think I think um, assets that are fully or almost you know almost close to being fully built out would cer- certainly be uh, of interest to us. And again, remember, we're a publicly traded company, so there's only so much dirt I can give at the moment before we've announced anything. Uh, look, we love Canada, and we're based. Our two main sites are in Alberta, and Alberta is an incredibly accommodative jurisdiction to our mining activities. And for your, you've got very savvy um, viewers. Obviously, being in the right jurisdiction is is a huge priority because you want to make sure that you've got government and regulators that are, you know, open to constructive conversation and and regulation in the spirit of innovation. So, so look, so that's why we're so bullish on Canada. It's great up here, um, but we are absolutely uh, open to going south of the border for sure. Again, there's been some really interesting opportunities that have popped up in the past couple quarters that you know we certainly were had them on our radar. Um, but uh, I think the premiums people were asking for and, and, and the rationale has, has become a little more reasonable now, um, which is good for us, again, as, as potential shoppers. Um, so, yeah, south of the border is certainly of interest. Um, you know, look, there, in Canada, though, there's still, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of hydropower in BC. There's also a ton of very cheap energy in Newfoundland, which is the east of Canada. There's not a ton of infrastructure there, um, but you can get power sub three cents over there. 
Um, and I'm just generally a big fan of the province. My dad's a newfie. Um, and it's just wonderful people there. So, so yeah, I mean, could we expand in Canada? Is there opportunity there for sure? But south of the border is definitely of interest. Now, would we go to South America? Never say never, but Jamie actually used to run um, uh, the South American arm of BlackBerry. And she, uh, it, it, she has firsthand experience about how difficult it can be to sometimes get assets out of South America if, for example, the political regime turns not in your favor. So um, I'm not sure you'd ever see us go there. Again, never say never, but I'm, I'm not sure. So, um, so yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, we've seen a little bit of that happen uh, with Russia this year. And then even more recently with BitFarms are struggling in that jurisdiction because of the currency crisis. Uh, yeah. Same sort of topic. Assets out. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just it's a global uh, global business. And sometimes you got to be picky and choosy where you're going to deploy ASICs because those are expensive. Sure. Sure. Um, same sort of conversation. Let's talk about your guys' Bitcoin hodl and how you guys use this in order to advance expansion. Uh, mm. From my understanding, you guys don't have any of that Bitcoin loaned out at the moment. You're just hodling it. Uh, but you guys do use equity in order to fund expansion, uh, which is a nice perk of being public. Uh, but then also you guys use your recurring revenue. So walk me through how you guys fund deployments at this point or even M&As. So I think, first of all, like, yes, we certainly have done capital raises to fund growth. Um, but fundamentally, from a philosophical perspective, the, the plan isn't to continue to just keep raising capital to fund growth. That's not sustainable. That's not a sustainable business model or a sound or really, I'd say, an intelligent business model. Um, so that's not sort of our plan. We were just, you know, uh, we wanted to take advantage of, of very um, favorable capital markets conditions. We're one of the most liquid stocks on the NASDAQ. So it made a lot of sense. The ultimate goal for HUT is to create sort of a virtuous circle, i.e., you know, um, have enough fiat based generating revenue or fiat based uh, revenue generating lines of business so that we can mine Bitcoin, continue our huddle, and then continue to generate revenue with other lines of business. Again, you know, tapping the markets for growth, that's not sort of, that's not the long-term business strategy here. Um, so, uh, so yeah, in terms of the HODL, you know, we certainly believe that there is a world, especially once we see interest rate, interest rates abate, uh, once we see the bull market come back from a macroeconomic perspective, not just crypto, um, you know, we certainly see a world where Bitcoin could potentially capture two to three percent of gold's uh, place in a traditional investor's portfolio. And if that happens, that alone in and of itself is like $100,000 slash north of $100,000 price per coin. And again, this this bear market is so much different than the last one because you have such a tremendous amount of adoption from institutions, you know, sovereign nations. And so we do think this time it's different. And it actually is kind of a good thing that Bitcoin is trading alongside, you know, the, the traditional tech equity space, which is, again, once macroeconomic forces come down and become a little bit more favorable to tech, we also think that Bitcoin's going to catch a bid. So we want to be in a position where we have a an enormous stack that we can build businesses on top of, that we can create more yield and generate yield on top of. Um, we're also the only miner that hasn't encumbered our stack. So Marathon's encumbered, I believe, about 70% of their of their Bitcoin stack. And again, that is also the benefit though of having a stack in a bear market is that you can you can use it to your advantage to fund growth and take out loans or debt or whatever it is. We haven't done that yet. Um, but it is certainly an option for us, you know, as we if this bear market continues, we we haven't encumbered that stack. You know, we did use our stack in the last bear market. It was only about 2000 or so, I think at that time, um, to take out a loan to 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 survive. And when times got really tough, when we saw Bitcoin at like 3K. Um, so yeah, that's how we think about HODL. That's why we're very bullish on Bitcoin. We absolutely think this asset price is going to go up and to the right, not financial advice, but we agree with the Kathy Woods of the world who, who also think the same. Yeah. I want to dig into that a little bit more. So just holding on to the 8,000 or plus Bitcoin that you guys have at this moment, what does that look like in five to 10 years? If you guys are able to hold on to it, are you guys turning that into some sort of like ETF product, or you guys, you, know, you said opening up new lines of business on top of it. Uh, but the plan, from what you're saying, is just to hold on to that, not to sell it at any point. I mean, look, if Bitcoin were to hit $100,000 per coin or $120,000 per coin, 
you know, we'd certainly reevaluate that case because obviously you would want to sell at a profit and then reinvest in the business. And whether it be we would reinvest into, you know, the tremendous growth that we're seeing on the high performance computing side or this Web3 services that we're looking at, that remains to be seen. So I'm not saying we're going to hodl forever, even if Bitcoin hits like a million dollars. You know, we we reevaluate in real time. Um, but for sure, the plan is not to sell at, at um, all time market lows or, you know, 2022 market lows. Um, so, so for sure, you know, building like maybe there is a day, a world where, you know, we, we are building financial services products on top of that stack. Maybe we do become one of the largest lightning node operators. Um, absolutely putting that stack back to work in yield generation is certainly of interest to us. Again, we're just sort of waiting to see how this FTX contagion flushes out. Um, I mean, who knows what's going on with Tether? I also see a bit of FUD about Binance's reserves. So we're just we're just hanging on cold storage until sort of things calm down a little bit. So then we don't have to worry about counterparty risk. Um, calls, derivative options on top of our stack is certainly also something we're looking at. So um, yeah, there's a lot that you can do when you have a huge pile of gold, right? Of digital gold on your balance sheet. Um, so yeah, that's why we're, we really see a lot of opportunity. Appreciate the clarification there. I want to riff on the question a little bit more and just ask about the model versus other miners. So again, we had Zach from CleanSpark on the other day, and they were known for selling off their Bitcoin during the year to fund operations. And you guys are the opposite model where you guys have held onto your Bitcoin, both very responsible models in the sense that you guys are both operating well, deploying more hash rate, haven't had any issues with bad debt. So I think that's a very nice sort of uh, positioning between the two of you guys. On their point, they're saying like, hey, we need to sell this because we are a cash flow business. We need to sell our Bitcoin in order to fund our operations and then grow from there. You guys on the other side are building out different lines of business and then holding that Bitcoin. So maybe like if you have any thoughts on the comparison between the two of them, and then I'd be curious to get your thoughts on how you guys are a business that really is building cash flows, but then you're holding on to them where others are using those cash flows to pay for monthly expenses. Yeah. So, so look, we had, we're, we look at ourselves as a call option on not only the future price appreciation of Bitcoin, but also the future growth of the web two, web three and, and crypto ecosystem. So we, that's how we look at our stock as we're a call option on, on the asset class, but also the entire growth of the industry. And that's why we focused on, on diversification and why, again, we believe that this asset class, you're going to be able to build on top of it. It's going to be incredibly meaningful. And so for sure, we understand the whole, you know, cash flow now, but we're building for the long term. We're building five to 10 years from now, right? So um that's why we're so focused on HODL. And and again, cash flow is absolutely a priority for us. That's why we have this uncorrelated line of revenue that's clipping us 4.4 million a quarter. Is that enough to keep the lights on right now? No, but we're growing that business and we're looking at other ways to continue to earn that fiat based cash flow. Um, there certainly is potentially a world where, you know, if we were to do inorganic MA, again, not confirming anything, but just saying hypothetically speaking, and it was um it was a you know a, a cash flow generating site that maybe was already selling their Bitcoin, that's something that we would perhaps continue to keep that site running as is. Um so. So, you know, cash flow is certainly a priority for us, but again, it's it's more the long-term play. It's we're 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 the call option on the future of this entire industry is how we're looking at it. Awesome. I appreciate you letting me dig into that question a little bit more because it's definitely notable. Well, you one, guys are well, one more thing I want to say just about the call option idea. We also like the fact that we're taking this call option from an infrastructure perspective because it takes the guesswork out of sort of what three web three resource is going to win. Is it going to be gaming with decentralized, you know, peer to peer micro payments or NFTs like is it going to be the polka dots or the Solanas of the world? It doesn't matter. We don't have to guess because every single project that operates on the web whether it be web 2 or web 3 or crypto um they all need infrastructure. They all need data center storage. They all need compute. They all need um you know disaster recovery and Citibank it was a couple months ago now. They actually um released a really interesting article saying that the metaverse was like a 20, uh, was like a $13 trillion opportunity by 2030. But one of the things that was missing was the compute infrastructure to actually support these applications. So, and that's exactly how we're 
playing this industry is providing that infrastructure compute. So we're like the racetrack. We're not placing the bet on who the winning racehorse is going to be. It doesn't matter because they're all running on our track. So it's the non-sexy stuff that makes the money. That's for sure. So I appreciate the the model there is, is pretty sound. Uh, thanks for letting me dig into that question a little bit more because I definitely think at this point, you know, we're in crypto winter. People are looking around and are pretty impressed that you guys have held on to your stack as far as other miners have gone. Let's dig into two news points that have recently come out about HUT8 uh, as we get close to closing up the show. And the first one is a disagreement with a power provider for your medicine hat, or believe it's your medicine hat uh, site up in Ontario. So correct me if I'm wrong on any facts there, but want to give you uh, an opportunity to lay the land for what's going on there. Uh, it's been in like your public disclosures. Uh, and just as we discussed before the show started, this is a pretty common occurrence for most miners during the lifespan of their sites, let alone right now. I mean, I know so many miners who are actually going through this right now, but you guys are public, so you have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So um, so just quickly, our, our two sites in Alberta are Medicine Hat and Drumheller. So those sites are in Alberta and are not affected by this whatsoever. That's 109 megawatts in production. Everything's great. Fleet is upgraded and we're good. Um, and so we had a third site uh, in North Bay, Ontario. We had about 25 megawatts that was powered up. And that was a behind the fence uh, PPA with a partner called Validus Power. And Validus Power, so look, they, they're friends of ours. Jamie's known them forever. They're, they're good people. They're sound business operators. And that's why we established a partnership with them in the first place, because we really felt that we could do some meaningful things together uh, in the market. Um, and then, but as with any relationship, as it goes on, sometimes you come up against, you know, things where you can't align on or you, or you, you know, you just fundamentally disagree. And then, so sometimes you have to shift the container in which you try and come to a resolution. So we have taken them to mediation. Um, we were the first to issue a notice of default, um, because there was some pieces of the contract that, you know, they, we, you know, we just could not sort of agree on that this was what was negotiated and that we need to, you know, continue with it, even though power prices have spiked. So, um, so we've had to change the container in terms of how we try and come to a resolution. We really hope, and we, we ultimately plan on coming to a resolution with them. Just, you know, we've got, we've now taken it to a more formal mediation process. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we hope to have a positive outcome because again, you know, we're good people, they're good people. It's just like any relationship, like a marriage, like any, you know, relationship, sometimes things go a little awry when people's opinions change. And um, yeah. Do you guys have any backup plans in case there's just like a fallout? And I mean, this happens in Bitcoin mining. Like I know, I know of many cases like this where you guys need to find a different energy provider for those machines or are you pretty, uh, I guess, sure that this is going to come to a good solution in the near term? I mean, we ultimately hope for a good solution. But again, as I've mentioned, M&A is certainly something we've publicly communicated. And that's absolutely um, why you know, we're not really freaking out here on our end because we've got the balance sheet to be incredibly agile and we've got great ideas in the hopper. And uh, yeah, we'll let you guys know about them as soon as we can. Appreciate it. Okay, last question for you guys had some news this morning as of Tuesday, December 13th, when we're recording this, you guys hired a new CFO. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, most people, when they see like a new CFO walking in, they're thinking, oh, that could be good or that could be bad. Uh, your guys' balance sheet looks pretty stellar. So it seems like a good situation. But tell me about that hire. Awesome. We are so excited for you guys to meet Shenif. Um, I will be taking him on sort of this, the media tour once he's um, ramped up. I think he, yeah, he's, he's coming to our Christmas party tonight uh, and he starts this week. And so we're really excited. Um, Jamie, our CEO, has actually known him forever. Um, they actually worked together for two years, again, in the, in the data and Jamie's sort of data center past. Uh, he comes from IBM. Uh, he's got a tremendous background in both the private and public company CFO space. He's extraordinary at modeling. Um, and he's, he's just a really great guy. We are very excited and he possesses the skill set that we, um, are really confident will take us into the future of what we see as aggressive growth on the horizon, especially when the bull market comes back, that we needed to make sure we had the right guy in the seat to help us sort of, um, you know, move in that direction. Um, again, our former CFO, Shane, a great guy. He led us through the, the data center M&A. Um, but again, Shenif is sort of just better suited to, 
to the growth that we're expecting and the needs that we would need out of a CFO for, for that growth. Yeah, just for the audience, and I'm personally curious, with your guys' balance sheet, with your guys' pretty limited model right, as of the, now in terms of spending your Bitcoin, what does a CFO look to, to do over the next few years? Like, is it the m a Is it some sort of like a I'm projecting the runway for the Bitcoin hodl? What sort of things does this person expect to do over the next one to five years? Yeah. I mean, look, again, there's only so much that I can I can um, tip in terms of stuff that hasn't been publicly disclosed yet, but I'd say all of the above. Um, and again, our past CFO, Shane, wonderful guy, very adept, helped us through some tremendous, you know, transitioning of the business. Um, but, you know, we certainly love that Shenef has this, this IBM data infrastructure, hands-on experience that he's bringing now to HUT 8 and our, you know, five to 10 year sort of plans. So um, obviously, again, we'll update the market with our future growth plans as soon as we can. But yeah, we're really excited. We think you guys are going to love him and I'm going to have them. I'm going to introduce him to you guys as soon as I can. Awesome. Well, Sue, thank you so much for your time this morning and joining the mining pod. Appreciate your expertise and learning more about HUT 8 as we close out the year. Thank you so much. Love your show. Our investors love your show and happy to be back on anytime. Thank you.